One of the important locations within H.P. Lovecraft's story, The Call of Cthulhu, is the great stone city where Cthulhu himself lies entombed, which rises out of the ocean, the city of Relay. And about midway through the story, there's this uh, chant, which I'm not going to try to read aloud with its crazy lettering, that the Inuit wizards and Louisiana swamp priests had chanted to their kindred idols. And Inspector Lagrasse is able to tell us what it actually means. In his house at Relay, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. And that's sort of the centerpiece of this story. Now, we encounter it first through the character Wilcox, who the narrator and the narrator's great uncle have both engaged with significantly. And Wilcox dreams of and then depicts and even describes to the extent that he can this vast city. So how is it, in fact, going to be described? So we have a bas-relief, and in it we have essentially three elements, some hieroglyphics, we have the Cthulhu representation itself, and it's done in a style that suggests the, you know, the vagaries of cubism and futurism, um, but it's going beyond those. And we get that there's, you know, a monster there, and then there's a city behind it, right? A vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. And that word cyclopean is going to be used over and over in this story at multiple points. Uh, you know, it's redolent of the Cyclops of Greek mythology. And we should remind ourselves that these aren't just one-eyed beings who are kind of dumb. These are, you know, divine beings who are pretty scary, right? And they're gigantic as well. So how is this city going to be described? Well, uh, we learn from young Wilcox, who is having these dreams that uh, the professor is now interested in, that uh, there's, there's a whole sort of landscape involved. He had an unprecedented dream of great cyclopean cities. And notice, this is the only place where we see it in plural, but perhaps cities, of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths all dripping with green ooze and sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics cover the walls and pillars. And then we also get this other element to it. From some undetermined point below would come a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation, which only fancy could transmute into sound, but which he attempted to render by the almost unpronounceable jumble of letters, Cthulhu Fatang, right? And the, the uncle knows that this is connected with a, a sort of cult. Um, Wilcox continues to have these dreams, and eventually the dreams are going to get worse. And other people are having similar dreams as well, right? So that's something that's going on. A little bit later in the story, we're going to learn retrospectively that Wilcox has described the perspective of this place in a way that's actually quite important, right? So we, we, we want to look at this. This is uh, at the time that Johansson is describing the city. Wilcox told me in his awful dreams, he said the geometry of the dream place that he saw was abnormal, non-Euclidean. We'll come back to that in a moment. R loathsome, redolent of spheres and dimensions uh, apart from ours. So what does that mean? So spheres, not literal spheres, globes or anything like that, but areas and dimensions. So reality in this sort of narrative framework is much more complicated than what we normally experience. And so the Euclidean is a little bit important here. Now, 
at the time that Lovecraft is writing, you know, there were some pretty significant shakeups that were going on within the world of mathematics and geometry and physics. Uh, you know, our notion of the cosmos as this nice regulated three, largely three dimensional with, you know, an additional dimension of time, uh, everything, you know, making sense, just waiting for us to understand it had been shaken to the core. And, you know, for us, non-Euclidean geometry, not that big of a deal in the present, but it was viewed as something kind of aberrant, something abnormal, something potentially full of implications of disorder, chaos, horror, right? So the city itself has a weird, unearthly geometry, right? And, uh, this is going to be borne out when um, they actually encounter the city. Then we get further accounts coming from these prisoners of the cult in Louisiana and from Castro. So the prisoners say that they worship the great old ones. Uh, they were now gone inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies told secrets and dreams to the first man who formed a cult that never died. This was that cult and they're waiting for the time when the great priest Cthulhu from his dark house in the mighty city of Relay under the waters would rise and bring the earth again under his sway. Someday he would call when the stars were ready and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. And in the story, that's what's happening, right? So the cult is, is waiting with its mission and we learn from Castro that the great old ones came down from the stars. They're not composed altogether of flesh and blood, but you know, they've got a weird kind of interdimensional or extra dimensional existence. And they all lay in stone houses in their great city of Relay, preserved by the spells of mighty Cthulhu for a glorious resurrection when the stars and the earth might once more be ready for them, but they need to have their bodies liberated. So they're, they're all living, at least some of them, in this city of Relay. And while they're there, they are dead, but not dead. They live, but don't live. They lay is a better way to put it. And they communicate with sensitive men through their dreams, spawning the cult, telling them where to find the images, uh, giving them sort of intimations of what's gonna happen, how the world is gonna be transformed when they come back. And then we also learn from Castro that this mental connection, this spectral intercourse uh, was blocked until, you know, Relay would arise again by the sinking of Relay beneath the ocean because the water interferes with this thought communication. So now we understand why Wilcox and other people are having these dreams. And then we actually encounter the city itself. Johansson and the crew of the Emma, now on the alert, they encounter something. They, they've you know, gone to seek out what it was that these people on the alert who they've killed, uh, who attacked them, were trying to turn them back from. What were they protecting? So what we see is they came upon a coastline of mingled mud, ooze, and weedy cyclopean masonry, which can be nothing less than the tangible substance of Earth's supreme terror, the nightmare corpse city of Relay that was built in measureless eons beyond, behind history by the vast loathsome shapes that seep down from the dark stars. There lay dark, the great Cthulhu and his hordes hidden in green slimy vaults and sending out last after cycles incalculable, the thoughts that spread fear to the dreams of the sensitive and called imperiously to the faithful to come on a pilgrimage of liberation and restoration. And the narrator says, Johansson didn't suspect this at all, but that's what he was actually encountering. And he also says, Johansson also didn't know this, Thank goodness for that, but this was probably just the mountaintop, the pinnacle, the citadel 
of the city. It wasn't the entire city risen up out of the waves. He says, I suppose that only a single mountaintop, the hideous monolith crowded citadel whereupon great Cthulhu was buried actually emerged from the waters. When I think of the extent of all that may be brooding down there, I almost wish to kill myself for with. But even with that, Johansson and the, the, the other people are awed by the cosmic majesty of this dripping Babylon of elder demons and must have guessed without guidance it was nothing of this or any sane planet. So it's, it's unearthly. And here again, we come to this geometry of it, right? And it, it consists in really two aspects. So he says, awe at the unbelievable size of the greenish stone blocks at the dizzying height of the great carven monolith and the stupefying identity of the colossal statues and bas reliefs with the queer image found in the shrine on the alert is poignantly visible in every line of the mate's frightened description. So what we've got is this gigantic, sublimely scary architecture that, you know, is, is way beyond human scale but it's also weirdly formed. He goes on, he says, without knowing what futurism is like, Johansson achieved something very close to it when he spoke of the city. Instead of describing any definite structure of building, he dwells only on the broad impressions of vast angles and stone surfaces, impious with horrible images and hieroglyphs. And I I bring up his talk about angles because it suggests what Wilcox had said. Now an unlettered seaman felt the same thing while gazing at the terrible reality. So Wilcox, you know, somebody who's actually studied perspective, is able to articulate what this city looks and feels like. Johansson is as well because he's in it. He's in that monstrous geometry. And they find out that things are not as they ought to be. What we read about is that angles that should be concave, or uh, curves that should be concave or convex and vice versa, angles that should be acute or obtuse, but we, we can't tell that until we actually encounter them. So we're also going to find a gigantic door and this is going to be a bit of a problem for the crew. First, it's a problem. What do we do with this, right? As Wilcox would have said, the geometry of the place was all wrong. They can't tell whether the door lies flat like a trap door or slantwise like an outer cellar door. One could not be sure that the sea and the ground were horizontal. The relative position of everything else seemed phantas phantasmally variable. And they start pushing on the stone and trying to find out how to make it work. And the stone is balanced. They manage to open it. And in this fantasy of prismatic distortion, it moved anomalously in a diagonal way so that all the rules of matter and perspective seemed upset. What's within? A darkness. A darkness that actually comes out. A darkness that is unlike darkness we know about. Almost material. A positive quality visibly darkening the sun. And then there's an odor. And then there's a nasty slopping sound. And we know what happens after that. And there's a, you know, a, a, an attempt to get away. One of the men is actually swallowed up by the angles of the place. We read that he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry, masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute, but behaved as if it was obtuse. So this is as much of the description of the city of Relay as we're going to get. And fortunately, the story ends with Relay sinking back into the sea, or at least the little bit that we've been able to see of Relay sinking back into the sea, taking Cthulhu down with it. We think. We're not entirely sure because the narrator himself can't be entirely sure. But it seems like uh, catastrophe has been averted for the time being. But only for the time being because some other time 
The city of Relay will arise again. The cult is still out there waiting to liberate Cthulhu and bring about a reign of the great old ones emerging from this lost city of Relay. Uh, 